Friends, our reading today is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, that'll be on the screen uh, on the website, or you can read along in your own version if you prefer. <clears throat> so, Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the heat of the day. He looked up and he saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet them, bowed to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have found favour with you, please do not go on past your servant. Let a little water be brought that you may wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. I will bring a bit of bread so that you may strengthen yourselves. This is why you have passed your servant's way. Later you can continue on. Yes, they replied, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, knead three measures of fine flour and make bread. Abraham ran to the herd and got a tender choice calf. He gave it to a young man who hurried to prepare it. Then Abraham took curds and milk, as well as the calf he prepared, and set them before the men. He served them as they ate under the tree. Where is your wife Sarah? they asked him. There in the tent, he answered. The Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years. Sarah had passed the age of childbearing, and so she laughed to herself. After I am worn out and my Lord is old, Will I have this delight? But the Lord asked Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time I will come back to you, and in about a year she will have a son. Well, Sarah denied it. I did not laugh, she said, because she was afraid. But he replied, No, you did laugh. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we love your word because we love you. We hang off your every word. It is the rule of our life. It is in our encouragement. It is our warning. It is our very substance, our very food. Father, by your spirit, would you apply your word to our hearts today that we might have the warning and encouragement you intend for us in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As a kid, I loved train travel. The Tamworth station was like a castle, and then, then there was the buying the ticket and the, uh, the little brass thing you scooped your change from, and the man with his big trolley and waiting on the platform and the telltale toot, straining your neck up the line towards Armadale. Is that it? And then there was the finding of the seats and the whistle and the lurch, waving to the cars at the level crossing. And then the siren call of the buffet car. But one thing I liked about it most was the peace. See, Dad wasn't stressed about traffic and Mum wasn't stressed about getting lost. You, you just got on the train and then you got off again. Simple. Well, simple for a kid with a family. But what if you were about 14 years old and you had to travel from Tamworth to Sydney for a camp in the holidays, on your own. No family to get off with at the right stop. Well, that was me. Oh, you'll be okay, says Dad. The train goes all the way to Central Station in Sydney, and then it terminates. It, it terminates, I said? Well, 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 what if it terminates before I get off? What if it terminates me? No, 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 it stops. It doesn't go any further. That's the end of the line, it terminates. Oh, well, well, how will I know when to get off? I asked. Well, the train won't be moving anymore. There will be no one left on the train. And when that happens, you get off too. Just stay on the train until it stops for good. Oh, right, but what if it doesn't stop? You get the idea. I'm a little worried about not getting to meet the relative I was going to meet at the other end. So Dad gives me a map and he's marked each stop. 
when you come to each station, mark it on the map. Maris, where's Creek, Broad Meadow, blah, 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 Hornsby. And when you get to Strathfield, you're almost there. It's the train stops in Central, and then you can get off. Now you can imagine me on the train, pencil in hand, marking off all the stops, and then it happens. I sit for an age, I'm the last one off, I check that there's really no more track left. Hey, I made it! There really was no chance that I was going to miss that stop, was there? If I simply stayed on the train, I would get to Central. So why did my dad give me a map? Well, because he wanted me to be confident that I'd get there. He didn't want me to worry for the whole trip. He knew I'd get there, but he wanted me to be sure. The map wasn't so that I'd get there. It was so I would have peace about getting there. Well, friends, Abraham is it's like he's on a train too. It's the train of God's promises to him. Big family, their own land, the whole world blessed through that family. And the train will not terminate and God, until God keeps each of those promises. Now, Abraham's a passenger on that train, isn't he? God's driving it. God's making it go. It's God who's going to get it to where it's going. Now, Abraham's wife, Sarah, is deeply tied to those promises too, isn't she? Now, God's put her on that train with her husband. So no matter how our two passengers feel about the trip, the train is going to get there. But God wants them to both enjoy the ride. He wants them to feel that growing anticipation to say, we've never been able to have children, but God is going to give us a baby. See, that's what God wants for them. He wants them to be sure and to have joy, to have peace in him and his promises. And today's passage focuses right in on Sarah, her fears and her doubts and what God in his kindness does for her. And he comes right to her front door to do it. Well, I'm at uh, point two on the outline, and it's a typical day in the land of Canaan. Uh, much of uh, Abraham's work's been done for the day. It's stinking hot, and it's time for a siesta. And the Lord drops in for tea. You see, it's a typical day up to that point. Abraham starts then as he senses something's just near the tent. He failed to notice these three men approaching somehow. They just seem to have appeared. And he's up in a flash. Bowing low, he does his best to get them to stay and enjoy his hospitality. We can read it there in verse 3. My Lord, if I have found favour with you, please do not go on past your servant. Let a little water be brought that you may wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. I'll bring a bit of bread so that you may strengthen yourselves. This is why you've passed your servant's way. Later you can continue on. Well, friends, Abraham's not a man who needs to grovel and cringe before other men. That's not why he's bowing down. He's the, huge, he's the head of a huge household. Hundreds of fighting men, herds of thousands, respected by kings he is. He's been visited several times by God himself. And that's the God who said, I will make your name great. No, he doesn't need to grovel, grovel before these men. He knows he's already been treated with honour by God. It's honour he doesn't deserve. And how has that changed him? What's well, made him humble, hasn't it? On the one hand, he doesn't need to puff himself up before anyone. On the other hand, he doesn't need to grovel either. In fact, he's not groveling. Instead, he's become so confident in God's approval, he can now just serve these travellers with nothing to prove. And serve he does. He's got really no idea at this point, I don't think, who he's serving. But he shows how thrilled he is by their visit. Look at him spring into action. Verse 6, So Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, need three, need three measures of fine flour and make bread. And Abraham ran to the herd to get a tender choice calf. He gave it to a young man who hurried to prepare it. And then Abraham took curds and milk in the calf he'd prepared and set them before the men. And he served them as they ate under the tree. 
So you could have asked one of his servants to do all that, but instead this stately man bustles around for his guests. And the bit of bread he promised them, well, that was a feast, wasn't it? And then he ser serves them and stands aside. So it's no wonder the writer of the Hebrews, of the book, the book of Hebrews, says to be like Abraham and to show hospitality or literally stranger love. And Abraham's about to find out just how strange these men were who have dropped in for tea and then got a feast. Well, so why are they here? Well, let's find out. I'm at point three. He wants Sarah to be sure. So it's after lunch and straight down to business. Verse nine. Where is your wife, Sarah? They ask him. Wife? How did they know he had a wife? Well, I guess they could have assumed it. Most men of Abraham's age would have had a wife. But how did the strangers know her name? And that name? She'd only been given that name, Sarah, a few months before. And it was God who gave her that name. And why were they asking? They would have known it's not proper for her to socialise with unknown men. But Abraham plays a straight bat. Well, she's there in the tent, he says. Of course, they already know where she is. This is the Lord and his two angels. But there's a reason they ask out loud. I think they're saying, Sarah, we know you can hear us back there in the tent. Sarah, we want you to hear what we're saying. Sarah, we're saying it to Abraham, but it's really for you. And what do they want Sarah to hear? Well, the Lord says, now, verse 10, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time and your wife Sarah will have a son. Now, when I first read that, I thought that was a bit odd. You see, there's no new information in that promise. Over the previous few decades, uh, as the Lord visits Abraham, he adds something new, something more specific about the, about the promise. You will have a big family that will become a nation and then you'll have a son from your own body and then you'll have this son with Sarah and you will call him Isaac and he will be born next year. And now God appears again but adds no extra details. So why would he appear again so soon just to repeat himself? See, it was only months before he did that before. Why? Well, let's continue in verse 10. Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him. And see, that's God's plan, I believe. She's sitting directly behind. And she'd have been listening to visitors anyway. But when she hears, where's your wife, Sarah? Her ears really prick up. And she hears, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now she's heard it with her very own ears from this man who knew her name, that the name that the Lord himself gave her. Well, what an occasion for joy to hear a second time, only one more year to wait. The very thing she'd long for, even from childhood, was about to be hers. The child promised would become a child of her own, a son, an occasion for joy, an occasion for laughter. But life has been teaching Sarah some very valuable lessons. Be a realist, Sarah, not a dreamer. Remember the facts. The facts that we are then in the text reminded of for the sixth time in the story. Facts that seem to mock Sarah and the promise to her. Verse 11, Abraham and Sarah were getting old and well, it was old and getting on in years. Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Oh yes, yeah, Sarah laughs all right, but it's not from joy. And she doesn't find it funny exactly. And it's not scorn, it's bitter disappointment. It's not easy to escape that feeling once it's decade after decade of being let down. Hopes raised, only to fade. Promises made, promises not kept, it seems. Promises which now pierce her heart every time she hears of a new 
new newborn, a newborn baby. What a joke, she, she thinks. Me with a baby. Worn out me. My old husband. A baby. The one delight I've longed for. Now as readers, we know the story, don't we? Or we might be able to guess what happens if we don't. She does indeed have a son. But poor Sarah. This is her life. She's inside the story. Living it out. See, we can skip ahead a few chapters, can't we? But she can't. All she's got is the promise that her husband has told about. And 24 years so far of waiting. And she's past menopause. Well, you can understand, can't you, why she'd laugh to herself? And it's only to herself. She doesn't throw back the flap and laugh in the visitor's face. But just a sad, hopeless little snort. It says, when I look at myself, I cannot believe what this man's saying. Even if he did know my name, I will not clutch at straws anymore. I'm done. Well, this is such a sad and unnecessary scene, isn't it? Especially to those of us who know how it turns out. Sarah could have been saved from this misery, this desolation. Imagine the joy that she could have had over those last 25 years if she would only take God at his word. If only she had believed what he told her. Well, it's still not too late for her. Of course, the baby will be born, whether Sarah believes it or not. The train of God's promises will reach its destination. But now, just months before it will happen, it's like Sarah's um, at Strathfield Station and God takes one more chance to show her the map, to show she's only one station away from her kept promise. One more stop. And then a little baby. Well, how does he do it? How does he take Sarah's finger and trace the track all the way to that last stop? Kids, uh, you'll see that um, as one of your kids' sheets. Abraham and Sarah on a train bound for that big station called God Keeps His Promises. Well, how does he do it? Well, he simply tells her he's heard her thoughts and he knows I know, Sarah, that you don't believe me. Verse 13. Why did Sarah laugh? Saying, can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is anything impossible for the Lord? Well, it's as if he's saying, Sarah, you don't know who you're dealing with. Think back over the last 24 years. You've been protected and blessed again and again, despite yourselves. Do you think it was coincidence? It was me. I kept on appearing to your husband. And now I've told, just told you that I will be back again. I know your thoughts, Sarah. When will you stop fighting me and just receive the joy I'm trying to give you? And so he patiently says for a third time, at the appointed time, I will come back to you. And in about a year, she will have a son. Well, they're words that should have made her heart sing. Instead, she's been focusing on how she can't pull this off. And so she robs herself of the joy, doesn't she? And she knows she's busted. And does this gentle rebuke from God finally break down her stubborn defences? Well, we're not told. But what we are told is this. When the promise is finally kept and the child is named Isaac, as God has instructed, well, it means he laughs. And as Sarah nurses that promised child, she declares, God has made me laugh. She has discovered joy in her God and the promise that he's kept. Perhaps now, though, she finally understands something else, that God intended her to have this joy all along. Deep joy in him, deep joy in his promise. Joy because she knows that he will keep his promise. And even joy while she waits for him to keep his promise, knowing he will keep his promise. Being at peace about the promise and all the time excited about the day that God would keep his promise. Well, guess what, brothers and sisters? God wants that same peace, that same joy for you too. 
for you and for me. So that's why I've called my last point, God wants you to be sure. But sure of what? I hope that's what you're asking. Well, we read it before in Romans. That promise. If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for us, who is against us? Friends, God has promised that he's for you. If you, in your soul, are poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore, God is for you. If all you've got to bring to Jesus is your need of him, if you've realised that you can't make yourself worthy, if that's you, God is for you. If you're simply a wretched sinner deserving God's wrath, but all you have is empty hands, God is for you. If you've seen how foolish it is to keep rebelling, if you delight now to take refuge in him, friends, if you have found refuge in the Lord Jesus, God is for you. My friends, in Jesus, God has given you a refuge from the horror of your own heart, the horror of God's wrath against you, that eternal death we deserve, and the horrors of life here in a broken world. In Jesus, God is for us. And he wants you to be sure of that promise. He wants you to be sure for your own peace and joy. He doesn't want you to be poor like poor Sarah. She missed so much of that, didn't she? She looked at herself and her situation and she simply wouldn't believe him. Don't do the same. Don't look at yourself and think, oh, God could never be for me. He could never be for me. Look at me. I'm not good enough. God could never be for me. Look how terrible my life is. Friends, with Jesus as your refuse, God is for you. Now, you can take him at his word at this or not. Now, you might be someone who has put their trust in Jesus as Lord. That's a wonderful thing. Your sins will be forgiven. But you might not be convinced, even if your sins are forgiven, you might not still be convinced that God is really for you. You believe you believe that he's forgiven you, but how does he feel about you? If I can say that, say it like that. You might think, well, sure, he's promised he's for me, but is that really true? Well, friends, if you can't take him at his word, when the storms of life come, you are going to be tossed one way or the other by them. If you don't believe he's really for you, you'll start to wonder if those storms are perhaps an indication of what he's really thinking in his heart towards you. Stormy and cold and disappointed. Or you'll resent him for those storms or any number of other things that are going to rob you from the peace and the joy that he wants you for you. Yes, he'll keep his promise to you and you will be saved if you're in Jesus. But life here will be one of anxiety and not peace if you won't believe him. Or you can take him at his word. If you do, the storms will come, but in them you'll have peace and joy and comfort. You'll know that even through these storms, he's for you. Friends, I also hope that you think about the storm of your coming death. As you do, if you take him at his word, you will have peace and joy even in that even, in, well, the thought of going home, the thought of going home to your promise-keeping God. Friends, our Father knows that it's hard for us to believe that he's for us. Sarah found it hard. We find it hard. That's why he tells us over and over and over again. He told Abraham and Sarah over and over again. And to here in today's passage, he has told us again. In Sarah's story, he does it again for us today. Friends, God will keep the promise that he's for us. But for our peace and joy, he wants us to be sure. 
See, in Jesus, you are also on a train headed for a station called God Keeps His Promises. Today, He's promised, if God is for us, who is against us? It's like a station that you can joyfully mark on that map on the way to that sure and wonderful destination. God keeps his promises. Let's pray. Father, you are a God who keeps his promises. We see in Christ that all your promises are yes and amen. Lord, would we take you at your word? We have no reason to doubt you. Time and time and time again, you have shown yourself faithful to the promises you've made. Lord, by your spirit, would you soften our hearts? That's to think so little of your love for us. Would you open our hearts so we can see what you have done for us that comes from your heart big for us in Christ. We pray in his precious name. Amen.